Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode <laughs> of Don't Yuck My Yum podcast. I'm Courtney Gilchrist. I'm Carlito Gilchrist. And today... You look very relaxed, by the way. Thank you. I am relaxed. <laughs> I'm, you, won't, you refuse to sit up. I, I'm relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> you... You I refuse just, to do this professionally right now. No, I am professional. I just know that this is going to be quite the subject of talk right now. So, so I need to be just, you know, in it. As chill as possible. As chill as possible to know. In that, case it bores you and then you need to have a place to sleep. Yes. <laughs> You're already in the position. You can just go and I'll just finish out the episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, oh, here we go. <laughs> okay. Okay, as you can tell, this episode was Carlito's pick. Mm-hmm. And this movie that my... It is a movie. ...loving husband decided to bestow upon me <laughs> to watch is called Dr. Strange Love. Or, or how I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb, <laughs> which is a ridiculous title. It is, especially since like the character Doctor Strange Love is barely in it. Yeah, which that confused me because I was like, it took a while until this Doctor Strange Love actually appeared. Yeah, and then I'm like, oh, okay, here's Doctor Strange Love finally. But you only really see him maybe four times. Yeah, and, like, the second time you see him, he's, like, cast in shadow, just kind of watching the scene happen. Yeah. I, I I looked up some, because I was honestly, like, re-watching. I'm like, wow, he really isn't in it that much. And I thought, why is it called Dr. Strange Love? And, like, why is he the to titular character? Um, and from is it, what, Was it just because it was a catchy name, or...? It could have been. I think it was also because Coop. So the the filmmaker Stanley Kubrick, one of your favorites. I wouldn't say he's one of my favorites. You but, talk about Stanley Kubrick films a lot, though. But it's hard to not because everything almost like goes back to him because he was very ahead of his time in a lot of things. I see. But uh, like, doc, I think he he called this movie Doctor Strange Love because. The character of Dr. Strangelove is, like, uh, he's a German scientist. He's a reformed, like, Nazi scientist. And he's supposed to, like, kind of represent the scientific progression with the, um, the atomic bomb. So I think, like, that's why he called it Dr. Strangelove. Because, like, that character in of itself, like, his importance to the world is was the, the reasoning for it. Right. And then, like, the second title... The or how I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb. It was something. There was like an old book. I forget what it was called. I should have wrote it down. But it was like some self help type book written in like the thirties that oh. Kubrick knew of. Like how to how to stop or how to learn to stop worrying and love. And lo- <laughs> relax or and something. Relax. Yeah, and I think uh, because there is no there is no narration. And I think, you know, so there is no character that's, like, explaining why I learned to love the bomb. It's I think it was Kubrick kind of saying, like, kind of poking fun at, like, the whole ridiculousness of the Cold War. Mm-hmm. Of just the, like, how it it was, like, this impending doom. And how it's it, it's a funny title because it's like, just stop worrying about it. It's fine. <laughs> like, the, the, don't worry about it. Like, nuclear annihilation is nothing we have to worry about. Right. Well, well, I guess before we go any further, yeah. if you don't know the movie Dr. Strange Love, which I did not before my husband made me watch this, the brief general synopsis is an insane general triggers a path to nuclear holocaust that a war room full of politicians and generals frantically tries to stop. Yeah. It's probably the most That's the- general, and this is the what IMDb yeah. has said about the brief description of what this movie is Mm -hmm. so i guess from my perspective yeah that's it's like the i guess the main plot is this crazy guy this general who hates communism hates communists thinks well who doesn't yeah let me tell you something yeah (laughs) let me tell you something (laughs) But this guy specifically... What's his name? His name is General... No. 
Oh, yeah. General Jack D. Ripper. Yeah. Jack the Ripper. Yeah. Which is kind of funny. Um, this guy, Jack, he is a general, and he decides that he is going to initiate these B-52 planes, mm-hmm. which carries the bombs. They carry, yeah, nuclear bombs. Yeah, they so carry like- nuclear bombs. He orders them without authorization from the president to go and attack the Soviets. Yes. To go and attack Russia, drop the bombs on them and destroy them all before they get us. Because in his mind, he is convinced that they have Now correct me if I'm wrong because I didn't wasn't quite catching this, that they have like poisoned our water. Right. And they- that the water is in that they poison is infecting us. I'm assuming to our bodily fluids, our bodily fluids, <laughs> as he keeps referring it to. <laughs> yeah, because he he explains to um, that the captain character at one point that he's like, do you know why I only drink? Um, oh, Lionel Man drink. Why, why he only drinks gin, rainwater, oh, yeah, and rain, distilled water. Rainwater. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He he says that so offhandedly. He says it to the captain. He's like, relax and make yourself a gin and rainwater. Yeah, a gin and rain. <laughs> water i was like what yeah and he's like what do you only see the the russians drinking vodka vodka that's all they drink all they drink is vodka it's because the water's poison and that's what that's what they're doing they're poisoning our bodily fluids and we gotta take them out now and and basically he can do this because there is a there's a bunch of plans for like okay if there is going to be a nuclear strike there's all these different plans that the guys in the b-52s um, have to abide by right one of them is plan r which is almost like an emergency one that is like uh, any any like commander in the military can authorize um nuclear mm-hmm. like uh nuclear strike and surpass like all the higher ups so like the president or anybody if, if it's like you don't have time to make a decision. It's like, oh, yeah. war starting. We got to do this. Or, so that's what he that's what he initiates as plan R. Right. Or I'm guessing if, if the president died, like I said, he couldn't initiate plan R. This was kind of like a way they could do it. Possibly. Right. So that like, could be a way. Because I think it's, well, I mean, it's like if the president dies, it's like vice president automatically becomes the president. And it just goes down the chain of command. Okay. So... That's the basic plot. Yeah. And apparently this movie is a comedy. <laughs> it is. It's yeah. a farce. It's a farce. It's like a it's a like a it's a, a slapstick sort of not slapstick, but there is some like pretty ridiculous stuff in it of mm-hmm. just like people just yelling and um arguing over like what to do and just it's basically poking fun at the idea of like if the wrong person set off the bomb, set off like a nuclear strike. Yeah. You know, and, without actual authorization to do so, right? And uh, yeah, it 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 takes it in a in a funny way, which I think is very unique for Stanley Kubrick, because I'm pretty sure all his movies up before this weren't really comedies; they were all like noir, like drama films. He did that Pass of Glory, which is a very like serious tone, like World War One film about like three soldiers who are going to be executed. Uh, he did the film, he did Spartacus, which he kind of, like, said, like, he doesn't really count that as one of his movies. Um, and then he did Lolita, which Lolita is, like, based off this old novel about, like, an underage girl and, like, her having a relationship with, like, her mom's new husband or something like that. Yeah. It's 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 not as gross. Like, if you watch the movie, he doesn't make it as gross as, it like, it sounds. But so this movie was like a complete departure from everything else he had done. Mm -hmm. And it's quite unique because it came out like at the time when like all this stuff was on high alert. You know, the the impending thought of uh, nuclear annihilation in the world. It was very much on like everyone's minds. And this is where you get like. Do you remember, like, were you, when you were in elementary school, did you ever, like, learn about this stuff and they would show you, like, the old, like, videos of, like, what to do if there's, you know, a bomb coming and it's, like, hide under your desk and, you know, stay away from the windows and did you ever watch any of those? Not in elementary school. I don't know if they ever showed us those, like, 
you're, what you're describing makes me think of, like, them teaching us how to hide from a tornado, like, for a tornado drill. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, do you have tornado drills? In Ohio, yeah. Did you? Uh-huh. I never had a tornado drill. Well, West Virginia, we didn't. Too too hilly, we wouldn't get tornadoes. Oh. I think, I, like, I think it's possible, like, a tornado could touch down, but it couldn't, it couldn't, like, remain. Because it would immediately, like, it would, I don't know, I guess tornadoes don't like hills. I would imagine, because, like, where tornadoes are, like, Kansas and all that, it's all flat. Right. But anyway, so wait, you had tornado drills? Yeah, we had tornado drills, lockdowns, you know, there's a shooter, fire drills. Yeah, if there's a shooter. Yeah, but yeah, we would have tornado drills, so, like, yeah, you'd stay away from the windows, you hide on your desk, or you'd, you know, put your book or hand behind your head so that nothing would hit you, oh. um, or you'd go up against, like, the lockers, stuff like that. So think of it as, like that except you're being told like okay if there is a bomb coming to annihilate us all these are the precautions you have to take Wait, they showed us one of my teachers showed it to us but it was like these old animated videos trying to make it like cutesy and fun for the kids in school but it would like it had like a turtle uh-huh and it's like oh you know it'd be like the narrator talking to the turtle of like what to do and it's like yeah you know it's like he would hide in his shell yeah, and all Timmy this turtle, and, go ahead and hide yeah. in your shell <laughs> It, no, it won't get you. It shows impenetrable. <laughs> you can do it. Just hide under your desk. No problems there. <laughs> yeah. So, so Kubrick's so Kubrick's idea was like to take all that and kind of just poke fun at it. Just yeah. you know the ridiculousness of it all because it was it was kind of crazy like to be thinking that everyone could live in a world where like this was a possibility now. Sure. You know. Yeah. So. So what did you think of the movie? I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't I didn't find it all that funny. I think the type of humor just didn't get me. Like it didn't hit my fun of bone mm-hmm. whatsoever. Um it was in black and white, which I don't mind black and white films. Like I like classic films. So I the black and white aspect doesn't bother me. I think for other people, there are people out there who didn't really like watch black and white movies like if i know there is some people out there like if it's black and white they're like oh no nah, i'm not gonna watch it i know what's wrong with which them? is a shame i know what's wrong with you what's wrong with you people i know you're listening <laughs> but no that didn't bother me i think it was the pace and the dialogue was just weird to me there was absolutely no females in this movie There's besides one. the one slutty secretary yeah which i was like of course this is such a man's film it is the one yeah. female we put into this this movie is she's in like a bikini pretty much and she's tanning self-tanning on like a bed with some light and yeah she's like the general secretary or whatever and clearly they're like together or something I, I think i could say that for like most of kubrick's movies like females usually aren't like big characters and all his films right and if they're there they're usually like they don't do much or they have like a damsel stri- like like a perfect example is um uh wendy torrance from the shining yeah like if you actually read the shining book by stephen king that character she has a lot more going for her and she's um uh, you know she can stand on her own but like when kubrick made the shining movie he just kind of what it, had Stephen King describe it? Like, she was almost like a, a wet towel of a character. She was just well, there to, like, scream just, and stuff. Yeah, she was really there to scream and freak out and run around. Yeah. So, Kubrick, he doesn't... He never really does do a lot of, like, strong female characters. Hmm, what but, does that say? <laughs> <laughs> but, like, this one, I think it was okay because it's, like, you know, during this time, like, all these... It would mostly be men in these positions. Like, yeah. the guys on the, the B-52... Everyone in the war room would probably be a man unless you'd have a secretary come in. Yeah. Um, I mean, I liked seeing a young James Earl Jones. He's yeah. one of the pilots or in gym, yeah. something, whatever, whatever he plays. He's like in the B-52 plane and he's one of the people there. He might have been, I don't know what was, I was trying to look at like the computer systems in front of him. He could have been like radar or something. Something. He's He's one of the soldiers or yeah. whatever yeah yeah he's just one of the many guys on there Mm-hmm. i was like oh young james earl jones he's had that same voice his whole life it seems yeah <laughs> like you even hear it he's like it sounds like they're there 
Yeah. Well, it sounds like Darth Vader. Your mind goes to Darth Vader. My mind goes to Mufasa. Mufasa. See, I think... And it, you can definitely tell there's a difference in his voice, though, between, like, yeah, Darth Vader and Mufasa. Older, but yeah. it's still that low, rumbling, thunderous voice. I really like, like, that new Lion King movie. This is getting off subject, but just, like, the new Lion King movie. Like, I thought it was cool that they brought him back to play Mufasa. Yeah. But, man, uh, he does sound old now. In, in, in like, you know, in, in, in the an aging way. way, in the best way, but, like, you can just tell. Yeah. You know, you're like, oh, he sounds so old, and but it's okay. I Did you know I saw him live, James Earl Jones, in a play? Did you? Yeah. Wow. I think, uh, who did I see that with? I, th- I think it was in high school. It was uh, my, we, my uh, high school theater class people. We went to, we always, like, you'd go to, like, New York on, like, a theater trip. And it was him and Vanessa Redgrave in uh, Driving Miss Daisy, like a play production oh, of it. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, it was cool. But uh, yeah, so James Earl Jones is in yeah, this. Yeah, seeing young James Earl Jones, was cool. that was cool. But, you know, he didn't have like a big part or whatever. But I mean, they bopped around a lot going from like the plane to the war room to the base where the general was. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, it was kind of funny to see like the one one Peter Sellers was the main actor where he played three different characters yeah so he played dr strange love he played lionel captain lionel mandrake and then he also was the president he played the president yeah president what Uh, was it mckinley yeah it's like an m yeah but um i actually had to look this up but did you know what also peter sellers is famous for he plays um the detective is he, is he in, in pink panther yeah he plays the main detective in the original like yeah. pink panther movies yeah that was what he was most famous for so i think this was pre pink panther okay yeah that makes sense mm-hmm. but um so you you didn't like it no. you didn't like the you didn't get the humor no i thought it was boring there was many times where i was like falling asleep <laughs> There, I will admit, there is a lot of uh, just um, instructional dialogue where... Yeah, it's, it's just like you're in the B-52 and the captain, this like silly like Texan... Slim Pickens. Slim Pickens. Yeah, that guy. Which that was him. That was him. Yeah, he did not put any sort of voice. Mm-mm. Like it was funny, I read that James Earl Jones thought that he was remaining in character while off camera. <laughs> And then he came to realize, oh no, that's just that's him. just him. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably that was probably the reasoning like Kubrick um, got him for that yeah. role because he was just like, I just need you to act this way. Yeah, just which be yourself. Slim Pickens didn't know it was a comedy, so he played it straight, supposedly. which makes it even funnier because he's yeah. not like over exaggerating it. No. He's just like being himself. Yeah, he's just being himself because he's just a funny guy. Yeah. At one point, he's listing off all of their, like, provisions that they'd have in these, like, yeah. pa- survival packs. <laughs> and I think he goes, like, three lipsticks, a pair of nylon stockings. He's like, man, y'all could have a great weekend in Vegas with those <laughs> things. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> yeah, a lot of the jokes, they almost feel, like, just so random. And I don't want to say misplaced, but they kind of just come out of nowhere. Yeah, I think in my mind just being me i'm like logically i'm like why would they have those in the pack like right. i'm totally missing the joke yeah like, that's the joke why that's would the they? joke why would they have all that and stuff to me i think i'm just like i think it i think about it i'm like that's i'm just like well that's dumb why would they need those so there's, par- <laughs> there's parts of the movie where it's like things are played so straight um and then there's just like these moments of ridiculousness like the the one i think the most famous line from this movie is when um they're in the war room, and the general guy, played by George C. Scott, yes. starts um, wrestling with the Russian ambassador because he's yes. like, he's got a camera, and he's like Trying on his back, the and they end up like falling onto like a bench, and the president comes over and he's like, gentlemen, you can't fight in here. This is the war room. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like that. I think I think for you, you're like laughing, and I'm just like shaking my head. I'm like, oh goodness gracious. <laughs> I should watch this with your dad. I know, you and dad would be fine. Like, I feel like if you're, like, a history buff and you like dry humor almost, so to speak. I love dry humor. Yeah, if like. If it's done well. If it's do- yeah, if you like dry humor and you, you, you're you kind of getting the irony of all of this, mm-hmm. then it can be funny. Yeah. For me, I was just kind of like, 
this I don't get it. Like this is stupid. <laughs> I think I think my one of my favorite moments is when the what was his name? The something Drake. Mandrake. Mandrake, that captain guy, also played by Peter Sellers. Yep. He's sitting there on the bench and the general Jack D. Ripper's like sitting there like explaining to him like his reasoning behind um activating yeah. plan R and is like having the B fifty twos go to Russia and do all this stuff. And he's, like, talking about the bodily fluids, and he's giving that whole spiel. Mm-hmm. And the captain's just sitting there just like, oh, God. Like, it's just, he's just, what is like, happening? he could just, he's just looking over at him like, this guy's crazy. Like, this guy's insane. But Peter Sellers sells that so well of just sitting there of, like, I'm sitting here with a madman. Yeah. I don't know what to do. He's locked me in here, and yeah. the world's about to end. I don't know how to do and anything. I, I need to get the code from him to stop it. Mm-hmm. And then there's a, and, and then... The general kills himself. He just walks into the bathroom. Yeah. And Which, he... that's not very funny. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think what's funny is just Peter Sellers' reaction of just like, uh... Well, yeah, because he's just going <laughs> off and he's all like, you know what, old boy? I think I'm going to get the code from you. Why don't you give it to me and then and we'll do this right or blah, blah, blah. And... Yeah, because the only way to turn the B-52s around yeah, is to for... to stop them from bombing there is Russia. A, there's a three-letter code that only that that general can knows that he can give, to but st- only he knows it Yeah, to, to stop, stop them. And he kills himself, so obviously they don't have the codes now. Yeah. Yeah. What would you think of um, George C. Scott? He was the general with the chewing gum who was just, like, acting, like, <laughs> radical and crazy, like, when he was explaining... His voice is funny, mm-hmm. like... Like, I read that they, Kubrick wanted him to, you know, really kind of act over the top and go crazy. Mm-hmm. And apparently Scott, George C. Scott, didn't understand why. He thought that was kind of stupid. Mm-hmm. And then after seeing the film, like, because he apparently didn't like it. He didn't like playing it like that. Mm-hmm. But then I guess he kind of was like, oh, I guess that was one of my best performances, even though it was... It felt weird to him. Mm -hmm. But apparently in the one scene in the war room, at one point his character falls and trips and then he gets back up and just continues on like normal. Apparently that was a a mistake. Yeah, I remember that happened and you were like, why did he fall? Yeah, I'm like, why did he (laughs) fall just now? Well, he does it like so well because he falls and then he kind of rolls into it and he just gets back up. Yeah, he he just falls out of nowhere and then he just keeps going. And I was like, what was the point of that? And apparently it was a mistake. It was like, it wasn't supposed to happen. He wasn't supposed to actually fall. But then apparently Kubrick thought that to just fit his character so well that yeah. he just kept it. Just why not? He's like, like oh, yeah, that's funny. That'll it, work. And what makes that kind of stuff funny, too, is especially this kind of humor, like, no one reacts. Like, you never see, the, the camera never cuts over to, like, the other characters, like, looking at each other, like, what, the, what is this guy's problem? Like, everyone's just like, yeah, this is... This is how it is, you know? Yeah. Like, everyone else is just just taking it, like, seriously, where you have this one character just acting all crazy. The big board. The big board. <laughs> but, but the big board. When the Russian ambassador is coming in, he's just like, but you can't have the Russian ambassador coming here, Mr. President. He'll, he'll see the big board. And it's like, obviously, it's the war room, so the big board is, you know. It all maps the map. all the, the B-52s of where they are. and Yeah, so they can track them and how close they are and, and everything. But I could see how, like, you could get bored of it. Because there are, like, a lot of just, all right, set when they're in the plane especially. Like, set this to that. I think set it's just a lot that. of lengthy dialogue of yeah. nothing happening yeah. in, my mind. In, my, in my opinion. It's like we spent, like, 20 minutes having the, the Texan captain read out all of these you know, commands and instructions. And all the codes. And all the codes. And then, you know, his guy's just repeating it back. It's like, all right, NEV flip switch one on. Yeah, and then it and cuts to, like, cuts to them him. actually, like, doing it. And yeah. then it'll, it'll even do, like, a crash zoom into, like, the, like, he'll flip the switch and it'll crash zoom into it. Like, whoo, like oh, okay, yeah, I saw that. That's cool. Yeah. I think probably for the time that was interesting to see all that. And I think Kubrick, he's very much for detail. So to intricately, like, explain, like, this is how, this is most likely, like, how it would happen. Like, you know, they, and just the show, like, on the verge of nuclear annihilation, these guys are just reading off codes and just pu- plugging them into the computer, or not the computer, but, like, the, 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 
the playing system, just all that stuff. Yeah. And just how they're all just playing it, like, so calmly and everything. I, I think, like, that was probably what was extraordinary about it at the time. Yeah, I mean, I think they had to recreate that whole B-52 themselves because the government wouldn't let them, like, just have one to film in. Right. So they had to recreate, the you know, the cockpit and, it, cockpit and everything based on, like, a picture of it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so I'm like, okay, that's neat. Like, like the I always like the stories of all the behind-the-scenes stuff of how it came to be. But as far as the movie itself, it just felt long. It felt like... And it's not, though. It's only an hour and a half. I know. It's only an hour and a half, but it felt long. I'm mm-hmm. just like, when is this going to get going? <laughs> or it felt just like it like, never went going for you. I never felt like it got to, like, the point. It just kind of was like... You, I almost had to keep figuring out what was happening. I'm mm-hmm. like, what's going on? What's the plot here? Right. Who are these people? <laughs> <laughs> what is this crap? What is this? <laughs> but you can understand, though, like, how... I, I, well, I think at the time this movie didn't really do well, but I think it's just because people probably didn't understand it. But, like, later, you know, it was something that was, you know, glorified as, like, probably one of the best comedies ever made one of the best like interpretations of like this sort of situation right and a a lot of pseudoscience is thrown in there which i also find humorous because all of it it it, in itself just seems ridiculous so like what you learn at the end that if the russian ambassador tells the president that if there is to be a nuclear strike on the soviet union there is a doomsday weapon yeah that the the Soviets have created that if they are attacked, the doomsday weapon automatically triggers itself and it can't be turned off. And it like just covers the world and radioactivity for like a hundred years, for a hundred (laughs) years. And they're like, and there's parts where, uh, the president is like having to talk to, I'm guessing like head Soviet man over there, Dimitri, (laughs) but they're played as like these, Almost like a old couple bickering over the phone. Yeah. Like, oh, Dimitri, don't get upset. Like, yeah, the planes are coming over. But, but okay, don't get so, mad, Dimitri. Like, they never... I don't... Maybe they did, but I don't remember them stating, like, who this Dimitri person was. But I'm yeah. guessing it was, like, the ruler of... Yeah. Like... That, that's the, the idea. The main leader of... Mm-hmm. Russia or something. I love it when the Russian ambassador hands over the phone and he's just like he's a little drunk. <laughs> like oh. saying just just warning you Mr. President, I think he's drunk. <laughs> so he's like talking to him and like I, even at the end when um there's like a few planes that the Russians were able to shoot down, but then the one plane that has like our main guys in it like Slim Pickens and James Earl Jones, obviously they're still going for it. Yeah. And the president's just like well, I'm sorry, Demetri. You're just going to have to try to shoot that one down. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I there, Watching it again, there was like a lot of things I looked at where I was like, you know, I want to see what this is. Like I saw the – like on George C. Scott's desk, like it it said like the – he was in charge of like the mega deaths. Yeah, what is that? So I looked it up. Mega deaths in like those terms means a million human deaths. So he was basically in charge of like calculating like, okay, if there's like this many bombs go off and like who's firing this, like how many deaths are we expecting? How many mega deaths? So if he said like, I'm sure if he could say something like five mega deaths, that means like upwards of like five million people. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was just a way of, Because I think talking in those terms of, like, nuclear destruction, it's not just going to be a few people, you know? It's going to be, like, in the millions, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Which I thought was kind of interesting. A lot of that lingo, like, it does kind of go over your head. Like, all of the... Like, like even at the end when they're talking about... Like, I didn't realize how, how ridiculous it is of... At the end, Dr. Strangelove is explaining, like, because after the bomb is dropped and allegedly the Russian doomsday device has been triggered, um, 
Doctor Strange Love starts going on this spiel in front of the president that we just all go hide in mine shafts and we just got to pick the best people and we can, yeah we'll we just get, live underground for like 90 years 93 years and it'll be like a 10 to 1 ratio female to male yeah, and 10 females to one male. To one male. And then you see like, all the guys' eyes kind of light up. And they're and all like, the general oh, that doesn't sound too bad. It's like, <laughs> look, let me get this straight. Like, you're saying 10 females to one male? <laughs> but then he's like, well, you, you'd have to get the right females who would be willing. They have to be attractive. And all. He's like, <laughs> so no, no monogamy. Yeah. Maybe this movie is sexist. <laughs> I think Stanley, I mean, uh, you know. Stanley Kubrick is sexist. Rest in peace, Stanley Kubrick. But yeah, I'm pretty sure he was he was probably sexist. He also, he was kind of a dictator of a director. Well, yeah, I read that Peter Sellers, who was pretty much the main guy, he didn't like doing multiple takes. He was like, you know, a couple takes, you know, get it, but not nothing crazy. Whereas Kubrick's like, we're going to do this again and again and again. For like a hundred takes. Yeah. So I'm like, he would make him do like a hundred takes at times. So Peter Sellers was not a fan of that. Well, Kubrick would also say stuff like he would get the actors to perform like at like the peak that they could, and then he would say something like, oh, "Okay, good. That was a good rehearsal. Now let's do it for real." <laughs> you know? Yeah. Just to just to continue. I, I guess his philosophy was like. You get them to repeat it so much to the point where, like, it sounds real. It sounds as realistic as possible, which I kind of disagree. I think it kind of... I think it exhausts them. Yeah, it exhausts the actors, and it it does... I don't think it sounds real. Like, whenever I watch a Kubrick movie, I'm not watching the actors and thinking, wow, they sound so realistic. That is exactly how people talk. They don't. It, it's more heightened, but I think it's because they're probably exhausted by this point. So everything they say is just coming out and just tired drags because he pushed them so much to the point of like they just can't, you know what I mean? Yeah. They just can't like perform well anymore. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It all depends on the scene. I think doing it for like something like a like a comedy movie I think would be – I think is unnecessary because, you know, you get those few takes and it's like you want to choose from that. You don't need like a hundred takes and then have to like go through and pick like what's the funniest thing, yeah. you know, what's the funniest version of that. But that's just how he liked to work. Sure. Yeah. But I th- I just think looking back at this movie, because I've seen it a couple times, like few years ago and i just thought this would be an interesting one to watch for you because it was so unique and different yeah i mean it definitely was different from what we've watched in the past i think it's the oldest movie we've watched yeah, so far the oldest movie we've watched so far yeah which i i'm fine with classic movies it was just like i guess this one just didn't it, it didn't strike, it, it didn't strike any chords with me. Like it, it wasn't very entertaining to me. As like I felt, the story kind of felt slow. The humorous parts were just kind of like eye rolling to me. Mm. I was just like, oh geez, come on. <laughs> yeah, like you could do better. Like okay, it was just kind of like it was silly, or I was just like questioning why things were happening the way things were happening. I'm like, well, what, what, what is this guy about? <laughs> What's like, the... like, um, well, first, like, with the general who is, you know, paranoid of the commies and just confused on why, why he ordered that to begin with. And then him t- going off about the whole water thing. Like, I, that part was kind of going over Bodily my head. Fluids. Yeah, I was like, what is he talking about? Which I think is interesting because you said it was going over your head. But I think that's, like, the point because it's so ridiculous i think you were just confused because you thought like everything else that's happening seems more um logical in a way because it's all like military tactile dialogue you know and like commands and codes and all this and then when he starts spilling out things about bodily fluids you're like wait what yeah 
wait, am I supposed to take this seriously or not? It, it like, it kind of makes your brain go, wait a minute, I'm confused. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I didn't know this was supposed to be a comedy. Uh, and then you're like, no, yeah, this is a comedy. I thought, I'm like, this is just weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, the, and the comedy, like, surpasses things that, like, you don't understand unless you know, like, things about the like the vocabulary behind um like the cold war like the whole thing with the mine shafts that that apparently that's something ridiculous because there was a term that was used during the cold war they would abbreviate it to mad mad and it meant mutual assured destruction pretty much means like um like that that that's what's gonna happen like if there's a nuclear um missiles go in like it's just boom everyone's gonna get killed you know like this is like there's an assured like thing of like this is every like not not a lot of people are gonna survive yeah and the idea that like you could hide out in fallout shelters or mine shafts ridiculous because everything would be like uninhabitable you know what i mean Mm -hmm. so that was like it was poking fun at the idea of like there's nuclear annihilation. Like, we're not going to be able to go hide in mine shafts. Like, there's no way. There's nowhere you could hide. Because you think of, like, like Chernobyl. Like, that place was so still in, uninhabitable. Like, you can't go there. And it's not going to be... You're not going to be able to live there for, like, thousands to a million years, you know? So, if something on that scale happened where the entire world was covered that way, nothing... You wouldn't be able to live there. Underground, nothing. Yeah. So, I think that's... Like, again, like, some of the comedies, just, like, it's it's very Kubrick in that sense of, like, oh, he gets it. You know what I mean? It's one of those things where it's, like, oh, the filmmaker gets why this is funny, but it might go over your head if you don't understand it at all. Yeah. Well, I think that – I think that's definitely true because a lot of the characters' names have, like, those double meanings or innuendos that I think he obviously knows and thinks is – and knows so that makes it funny. Yeah. But most people probably wouldn't know. Some are obvious. Some are obvious. Like Jack D. Ripper is obviously, you know, the famous London serial ki- killer, you know. Mm-hmm. But like like the president's name I read, Markin Muffley is his name. <laughs> Apparently, Muffley. that refers to female parts. Like a uh. Merkin is a, is a pubic hair wig. And a muff is slang. For a woman's pubic hair. Yeah. So, <laughs> like, I don't know that. Who knows that? <laughs> like, what? and that's what he named the character, Merkin Muffley. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Like, or, um, yeah, the Soviet, the, or no, the one guy, Turgidson. Mm-hmm. Apparently, a turgid is a word describing the condition of an erect penis. Ah. Like, it's all these... Apparently, innuendo names for I, these characters. Like, no one knows these things. I think Stanley Kubrick might be sexist. I think he might. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm not surprised. I'm not. I mean, like, the majority of his films don't have a lot of female characters. And if they do, they're they're just kind of there to just do one thing or kind of fill just, like, some small role like you need. Like, they don't have anything integral to the plot other than, like, maybe just to, like, give information or to have like a like referring to the shining like a surrogate character to have you like oh it's this is scary because she's really freaked out you know yeah well well <laughs> 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 but I, I i admire kubrick for like his his work i mean he definitely he was a dedicated filmmaker and i think it's it's pretty brilliant for him to come up with like all of these ideas for this movie at this time, you know what I mean? Where yeah. a lot of people weren't really doing this. Like, it, there's another movie that came around around this time that kind of had the same sort of plot as this, which is also a really good movie. It's I think it's called Red Alert. I think is the name of the movie. Well, Red Alert was oh, no, Red Alert. the name of the book right. that yeah. the movie was based off. There is another movie though that's similar to this. It's similar to Doctor Strange Love. Came around around this time, and. It's more. I think it's more dramatic, but you know, I think what's interesting is that like he decided to like make it a comedy 
which to me is like the complete opposite of like what Kubrick is. He's more of like, you got to take this seriously. You know, like this, this shot is framed in such a way that like, this is how the audience should react. And it's like, there's a part of me where I watch a lot of his movies and I'm like, I can't help feel the pretentiousness in a lot of this, Mm -hmm. you know, like just the, because like shooting like one thing, like making an actor repeat things over and over again is one thing. If you're just shooting the same thing over and over again, just because it gets to a point where you're like, okay, come on. Like, do you really need to? Do you need 50 takes of the same thing over and over? Exactly. That must have been really expensive. Was he just burning through cash like no one's business Uh, i think i'm pretty sure he would go over budget he would go his uh production days like he would he would surpass like it's like oh you shoot the movie in 100 days and it would take him like a year and a half to make the movie like i think it was full metal jacket his vietnam war movie uh took like two years to make barry linden which you've seen Ugh, hated it (laughs) it's the same thing it took like two years to uh make that but we did watch another movie this week which had something to do with uh nuclear stuff do you know what i'm talking about nuclear stuff are you referring to godzilla Godzilla. (laughs) well i i just wanted to bring that up because um wanted to make this episode more exciting but (laughs) (laughs) But also to, like, just to show, like, uh, the effects of, like, explain, like, the effects of, like, how things that happen in the world really do have an effect on, like, the culture. Like, this, like, Dr. Strangelove wouldn't be a thing that would exist without, you know, the the Cold War and the atomic bomb and all this stuff, you know. And the idea that it's, like, we we freely are talking about the annihilation of everyone on the world and then making fun of it. You know, it's extraordinary. And then you take something like Godzilla where, I mean, the reason we, we watched the 2014 movie because Kong, Godzilla vs. Kong is coming out and you haven't seen the other movies. So I'm like, let's watch them. They're big dumb monster movies. So, you know, it's fine. But like Godzilla's origins stems from Japan's like fear of the atomic bomb because they were the ones who were directly affected by the beginnings of all this. Like, the annihilation of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, like, ended World War II. And then it started this idea of, like, wow, we can make weapons that are so powerful they can annihilate cities. And so Godzilla represented, like, their fear of that as, like, this giant, like, looming monster that destroys everything in its path. And then you got something like Dr. Strangelove, which makes fun of it. You know, mm-hmm. I just think it's rather interesting. I've just been thinking a lot about this stuff recently, too, because I've been rereading uh, Watchmen. And I'm sure at this point, everyone knows what Watchmen is. It's a graphic novel. It's a superhero novel. But it takes place in the 80s, and it has a lot to do with the Cold War as well and nuclear annihilation and, like, it, it's like into the 80s and such. And I, I didn't catch this the first time, but, like, I reread this every like couple years or so, like three, four years or something maybe, just to kind of see if there's anything I missed. Because it's one of those books where it's like I find something new every time. And I caught that this time in the book, in the comic, when they're talking about like, like oh, it's, you know, it's the, the doomsday clock's getting close to midnight and, you know, there's a possibility of nuclear annihilation and the Russians have invaded Afghanistan and all this stuff. Apparently, in the one of the newspapers for the um, in the book, they explain like if there is a if there is a nuclear attack, and if you have family members that are like if they die from like radiation poisoning, you are to do, you are to put them in a garbage bag and put them out front to be collected. That's terrible. <laughs> I know, but it's just it's crazy how just you know. Like, you can just – how everyone, like, freely talked about this stuff. You know what I mean? Mm. I just think it's it's incredible that it's, like, this is this is a conversation that we can have, you know? And, like, relating it to, like, what's going on now, you yeah. know, of just, like, this terrible thing that's happening all over the world. Um, and, like, people are just getting sick left and right. And, you know, it's so unpredictable of, like, what's happening and yet there's still this feeling of 
you know, you watch the media and the news and everything and it it's all so dire. But then you walk around and it's like everyone's just continuing on with their lives the best that they can, you know? Yeah. So it's just it's it's just mind boggling to me. You know? And not and the pandemic and the Cold War, two completely different things. But just the the thought of like just this impending doom and how it affects the human mind, it's just crazy to me, you know? And especially how you have different people have their different interpretations of it. You know, Japan makes Godzilla. Stanley Kubrick makes Doctor Strange love. I, I, think, I think it's just like, it's weird how people can kind of, you know, make, make art out of it in a way. Because it's almost like a coping mechanism. You mm-hmm. see what I mean? It's, yeah, like how do they cope with the reality of it? Yeah. And I, th- I think it's quite extraordinary that it's like he was able to make this movie at a time where this was very real. And I mean, like this could happen. I mean, at the beginning of the movie, they have like a like they have an explanation that scrolls up and says like, you know, there are different implications in place. The United Air Force, like this is not how it would go down and all this stuff and blah, blah, blah. No, and they actually because of this film. They actually changed some of the policy. Oh, I'm sure. And, yeah, and realized that <laughs> this kind of thing would not happen in real life. Like, let's not um, let's not have like an active plan where someone could possibly just set off uh, World War Three. Yeah. And destroy all like human life on Earth. Yeah, that wouldn't be good. No, I, I don't think so. I was trying to see if there was anything else I had to say. Yeah, his Sellers acting kind of reminded me of, like, Gene Wilder. Mm. Like, he kind of gave me that vibe of his outlandish characters. And, like, the G- like Dr. Strangelove, in a way, kind of reminded me of Frankenstein. Like, Gene Wilder's Frankenstein character. In, um, oh, you mean the in Young Frankenstein? Yeah. The guy with the fake arm? Yeah. Is that who you're talking about? The 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 police captain with the fake arm. Well, that that what I mean like I think Gene Wilder's acting style and Peter Sellers' acting style, they kind of were similar to me oh, in those characters. Gotcha. I just kind of had that vibe. Yeah. Yeah. Also. Just with like like specifically I think with Peter Sellers' Dr. Strain Love and then Gene Wilder's, you know, Dr. Frankenstein or Frankenstein or uh, they just like, I don't know. I think their mannerisms and just like how they were talking. I think I just kind of got this like vibe of like they were similar, just like the actors and like how they played it. I just like, oh, this makes me think of Gene Wilder. It goes back to like old styles of comedy where jokes were they were told differently. You know, a joke would be more of just someone having normal dialogue. But it was the way that they, you know, the way that they said it. That was what made it funny. It wasn't so much that they were saying funny things, I, at least in, in my head. Like how you mentioned about Gene Wilder and Young Frank. Like a lot of his lines in that, like on paper, I'm sure they, they're kind of funny. But it's his performance that brings it out. And I think that's probably what Peter Sellers had to do here. He had to take like this more... When you think about it, like ridiculous dialogue, like all the stuff about mine shafts and everything and talking about like the women and, uh, you know, all that. But it's the way that he sells it that makes it work. Mm -hmm. I love at the end, like how the the last line of the movie when he just stands up and he just goes, Mavira, I can walk. Yeah, which that was totally ad-libbed. Oh, was it? Yeah, like, apparently half the time, most of Peter Sellers' dialogue was ad-libbed. Like, they didn't know what he was going to say. Oh, that's interesting. They would just film, and then he would just do his thing, go. and, yeah, and then that last line was, he just added it. They didn't know he was going to say that. I wonder what the purpose of it was, like, the implications of, like, why have him stand up and say, like, he can just walk right at the end. Mm. I I kind of thought of it as, like, and it was, again, and like you said, it's just Peter Sellers riffing, just doing his thing. But you could almost think of it as, like, the total craziness that... Because at the end, the movie ends with nuclear annihilation, basically. Because Slim Pickens and his guys in the plane, they drop the bomb in a very humorous way. 
where the um, the doors aren't opening. So Slim Pickens has to go down and like mess with the controls and he's like sitting on one of the missiles. So when it actually does launch, it's going down and he's like riding it like a horse. And he's going like, yee-haw, yee-haw. So as the bomb's dropping, he's just on there just riding it like a wild stallion down to the destruction of the world. And I think it's kind of funny that it's like he – it's like this crazy – thing that you never would think would actually happen is happening and it's like then at the end dr strangelove can just miraculously walk it's like the most the the things that you think couldn't happen like a handicapped person just suddenly walking like oh it can happen and the and it's humorous that it's like oh this is happening right at the end of the world you know yeah <laughs> it's like finally like the world's ending and he's just like i can walk <laughs> yeah i think it's just so supposed to be this just funny moment of like the world's ending but <gasps> i can walk yeah and it's like oh no darn <laughs> <laughs> that's it yeah but i don't know i th- i i enjoy it i mean it's not is is it one of my favorite movies ever? No, but I just remember like enjoy watching it. I th- I may have just enjoyed watching it like by myself. It's hard. It's like if, what are you trying to say? Well, I think like if I know you're not enjoying something, it's hard for me to like watch it, or at least if you're not being entertained, because I could just tell you weren't being entertained by this at all. <laughs> oh, my my opinion was affecting you, babe. Not so much your opinion, but it's like I just don't want to feel like I'm wasting your time. You know, well, it's not wasting my time because we were, you know, we watched this for the podcast. So right, I understand, but like, you know, it's it's like if, you know, you're on like a date or something, and it's just like, hey, let's go see this movie, or oh, let's watch this movie, and your date obviously doesn't like the movie; they're just bored or like playing on their phone or something. You feel bad, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, so it's almost like I felt bad. I'm like, I'm sorry, making you watch this. (laughs) Because like, I know a lot of it was probably going over your head because you're like, I don't know what is they're talking about what's going on or anything yeah i think i started to understand like like i got the gist of it like okay they released the b-52s these bombs that were trying to stop them like i got the main gist of it but uh, yeah it just didn't it just wasn't that funny to me it didn't quite register with me and it just kind of yeah just wasn't wasn't my thing do you have any questions you need to ask or, like, anything you want me to explain? No, I mean, I think just in the, just with discussing it now, like, it, it makes sense. Like, I get why Stanley Kubrick made it and, like, I get the story mm-hmm. just by us talking about it now. I'm like, okay, like, I get it with the whole, with, like, like I said, that I think if you know the history of the Cold War and everything and, like, I think if you like the dry humor, then I think this would appeal to you. So don't not watch it because it's not my yum. It mm-hmm. could be somebody else's yum. Exactly. Or someone's yuck. Or someone else's yuck and then they understand me. <laughs> the I remember listening to a, an interview with Stanley Kubrick about his reasonings for making this. I mean, it was basically like everything that we've talked about. But you could tell like from the way he was describing it, it was like he really was ahead of his time with this kind of thinking, you know, of like, oh, this is my reasoning for it. Like, I think, and it is something like you can kind of poke at and make fun of, you know, like you have, um, you probably didn't see it, but there was that movie that came out a few years ago with uh, Seth Rogen and James Franco, The Interview. I did not see that. Yeah, where they were going to South Korea. I know what it is. It apparently caused a big like oh it was pulled from theaters and all this stuff and they were like getting death threats and everything it was pretty bad (laughs) it was bad and then they just threw it up on netflix it's it's actually it's actually a fun movie but just like you know like i feel like a movie like the interview couldn't exist without something like this you know Mm -hmm. of just like being able to like when in the middle of something crazy happening just being like yeah you know what we're just gonna do it yeah you know, screw it. Like, whatever happens, happens. Like, we'll just... We want to make this... It's something that intrigues us. Especially because it was something so 
astronomical the idea of like the end of the world Mm -hmm. and the fact that the movie ends with the end of the world yeah it's like oh well that happened because they dropped the bomb and essentially the doomsday device goes off and what's funny is like as dr strange loves like explaining like about the mind shafts the president's just sitting there with a drink and he just looks tired and it's he almost has like this look on his face of just like whatever (laughs) you know like i tried man like i don't know what to tell you (laughs) yeah like he's like i really did i thought i thought it was gonna be fine but it's not i'm just gonna drink (laughs) it's whatever at this point yeah i read that kubrick had an idea for the ending to end with um two things but they didn't make into the film one was they were gonna have because if you look at the war room, there's this big, huge table with a bunch of food on it that yeah. that the characters never eat. <laughs> no, I know. They're never eating. But there's this huge table with all this food. And at that one point, Kubrick thought of having, like, everybody have this, like, food fight because they were all getting so frustrated and angry with each other. That'd be funny. But that didn't happen. Right. And then at one point, he was going to end the film with, aliens looking down and watching all of this happening oh (laughs) jeez i think either of those could work like maybe in theory they might be funnier than execution yeah but that that's hilarious just aliens just up there just like just watching all this happen like oh man look at those earthlings (laughs) jeez i think it's i was just gonna point out because you mentioned like the war room like the way that table looks i think in the watchmen movie i think like the the look of like the war room scenes in that movie like are in um like they're representing like how it looks in this movie oh Dr. like Strange they Love. based it off dr train love yeah makes sense yeah but yeah so i don't know babe i think <laughs> Maybe I'll get you to like one of my movies eventually. I know. The the poor listeners are probably thinking, man, is she going to like anything? <laughs> she doesn't. She doesn't like anything I like. That's not true. <laughs> I know there are films out there that he'll show me that I will actually like. I just think you are purposely holding back. I think I am. I think I'm waiting. I think I just want to surprise you. Yeah. I think whenever I'm going to show you a movie that I think you're definitely going to like, I'm just going to not tell you what it is. I'm just going to put it on and then... Yeah, do it. Just surprise me. Okay. Yeah, fine. Okay. All right. Good. Great. Wonderful. Perfect. Awesome. Just freaking fantastic. (laughs) (laughs) So I guess I'll just ask the the question. Do you yuck it or yum it? Oh, it was a yuck. Yuckety yuck yuck. All the yucks was for this one. (laughs) Kubrick's rolling in his grave right yeah. now. Yeah. I don't like any Kubrick films. I'm trying to think if there's any Kubrick movie that I think you would enjoy that you have not seen. All the ones that you've had me watch, I just don't like. You didn't like 2001. No. Oh, I hated that one. That was probably... That was worse than this one. You didn't like Barry Lyndon. No, that was so boring. And long. Good you great. wouldn't like... I. You would not like Full Metal Jacket. No. I could... I, you just wouldn't. No. You you didn't like The Shining, I don't think. Uh, I don't like scary movies. Okay. So that's probably the main reason why I don't like The Shining. You definitely won't like Eyes Wide Shut. That sounds really terrifying. Yeah. Um, it's not terrifying. It's just I can't explain. Creepy. It it, it? Yeah, it's very just creepy and messed up. Off. And you okay. definitely will not ever in your life ever like a Clockwork Orange. Ugh, no. There is no way. In any reality of our existence that you could ever like that movie. No, I. that's disturbing. I could just tell. I think you would like if... Because I think when we... My, your dad and I watched Pass of Glory. I think there is a part of that movie you would enjoy if you actually like watched it. Because I think you fell asleep. <laughs> I don't think you were bored. I think you were genu- I think I genuinely t- tired. Yeah. But I think if you actually watched that one from beginning, that you might actually enjoy it. Well, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. But, uh, okay. I guess that's it. Yep. I hope we didn't solve, you know, the the issue of the Cold War, but I hope we shed some light on it for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, we did, we did not solve the Cold War. I wish we could. Well, I mean, we're a little we, too late. We're a little late if we did. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess everyone just tune in next week. For Courtney's pick. <laughs>
Yeah. Everybody loves Courtney's picks. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and you will, too, babe. I think there's literally only one I haven't liked. Everything else you've chosen, I've been like, yeah, this is good. Oh, was it The Greatest Showman? Ugh. You don't like that one. No, it's terrible. So sad. It's awful. You like the music. I know you do. I refuse to, though. <laughs> Well, thank you, everybody, for listening to another episode of Don't Yuck My Yum. Be sure to turn in next weekend for another chance to listen to us. Argue. About movies. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, and bye. Bye. Hey, everybody. This is Carlito Gilchrist from the Don't Yuck My Yum pod. I just want to say thank you to everybody who's tuning in and listening every week. We really appreciate it. If you'd like to leave a review for the show, you can leave it um, on Apple Podcasts. You can uh, give us a one to five star rating. Uh, We prefer the five star ratings, but, you know, it's your opinion. It's whatever you like. Uh, As well, you can listen to us on Spotify and Anchor.fm and anywhere else where podcasts are available. I believe we're up on there. If you have any suggestions for future episodes or insights on past episodes, you can always email us at don'tyuckmyyumpod at gmail.com. As well, you can follow us on don'tyuckmyyumpod on Instagram. And yeah, I just want to say thanks for listening, everybody. We really appreciate it. Have a good week. So long. Bye-bye.